Good afternoon. This is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO of the CFIDS Association of America, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the first webinar of our 2013 Spring Webinar Series, and uh, I'm so uh, thrilled with the response that we had to today's program and the topic that we'll spend an hour together uh, learning about. Before we get into the meat of the program, I wanted to give just a few overview comments and uh, just update those of you for whom this is your first webinar on just a few housekeeping uh, tips as well so that things can move through slowly or smoothly actually. Um, today's topic is an overview of the drug development landscape and we have with us uh, guest speaker Kristen Schneeman from Faster Cures and I'll introduce her in a moment. This is, uh, as I said, the first of our six weekly webinars that are going to take place from now until May 9th. And the intention behind this webinar series is really to catalyze our community for informed participation and action uh, in a FDA workshop on drug development for CFS and ME that's coming up next month on April 25th and 26th. And then just about a month later, the Federal CFS Advisory Committee will hold its spring meeting on May 22nd and 23rd. And both of these meetings offer the opportunity for uh, patients and advocates to participate in the process and help shape policy. So we define this set of topics to really inform the community about um, different processes and issues that may come up in the context of these meetings and really um, empower them to participate as fully and meaningfully as possible. The other part of our spring series uh, is a patient-focused survey that we're conducting. Um, we launched it about a week ago and actually the number when I just before I logged on for this was at 600 and 761 participants so far and just about 90 percent of the participants that have uh, already begun or completed that survey have been diagnosed with MECFS by a healthcare professional. So that is a tremendous response and will help inform the FDA workshop the CFS AC meeting and other policy venues and uh, processes that, that uh, we are involved with. So if you haven't had a chance to take that survey yet, you'll get a link to it in the follow-up email you receive after the webinar and we encourage and invite you to do that and also to share the link with family and friends who might also have valuable perspectives to contribute to these dialogues. As far as today's webinar goes, we are recording it, and I think that is working smoothly. I'm hoping it does. So we'll be able to post this recording on our Solve CFS YouTube channel uh, sometime later this afternoon or first thing in the morning, and you'll receive a link to that recording in the email uh, follow-up email you received from us. We also have posted several additional resources for review and regular reference on our Research First site. Um, including some of the Faster Cures publications that Kristen will mention uh, in just a few minutes. And um, although we won't be able to get to every question that was submitted through the registration process, please know that those questions do help us shape our programs. They help inform not only the topics we have scheduled, but also um, programs that we've kind of calendared out for the rest of the, the summer and into fall. So if we don't uh, get to a specific question you might have submitted through today's for today's program. Know that there are five other programs already on the schedule and some others that we have in mind and uh, we'll announce later on. Um, somebody asked if there was a way to just register for all the webinars at one time and I'm sorry that GoToMeeting doesn't make that available to us but um, we are uh, very appreciative of your interest in participating in all of them and hope that you do. So today's topic is, um, it sounds sort of dry, the overview of the drug development landscape, and we tried to translate that into uh, language um, that might make a little more, might resonate a little bit better with our community. Um, and if you look at this picture that I think comes from the Myelin Repair Foundation, an MS uh, research organization, it's how do, how do you get from this side of this valley of death, as it's called, where um, discoveries in the lab to the patient over here waiting uh, 
usually impatiently, for better treatment options and cures. And that is really the topic that, that Kristen Schneeman is going to cover with us today. And Kristen is the program director at Faster Cures. She and I um, met in person just about a year ago at the Milken Institute Global Conference, although I had been a fan and a follower of Faster Cures for much uh, longer than that. And at that meeting, I had the chance to talk with Kristen and her colleagues about how the CFIDS Association has right-sized venture philanthropy models being pioneered by larger and better funded organizations like the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Myelin Repair Foundation, um, for our scope and budget and uh, just was very warmly received by the Faster Cures team, and uh, we've had just a, a, a marvelous working relationship over the past year. Um, Kristen is really one of the unsung heroes in the disease advocacy movement. She's been instrumental at Faster Cures, making these models accessible and helping to find best practices for organizations that want to accelerate the pace of progress and come up with better solutions for the patients they serve. She joined Faster Cures just about eight years ago, bringing 20 years of experience in policy, academia, and media to bear on her organization's vital mission. And I believe she's the first guest speaker we've ever had who's also won an Emmy Award. So uh, congratulations, Kristen, on that honor and for bringing your tremendous experience and perspective to our community at this vital time when there are so many exciting and important things happening. So with that, I'm going to turn the controls over to Kristen, and we'll hope that the um, technology cooperates with us smoothly here. The audience will see a change in slides from mine to Kristen's. And Kristen, take it away. Thanks for being here. Great. Well, hopefully I can see my slides. I hope everyone else can, too. Thank you very much, Kim, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for participating today, for taking an hour out of your day to uh, uh, hear about this topic. Um, uh, as Kim said, it sounds very dry, an overview of the drug development landscape, but um, I, I promise to make it as lively as I can and to pack as much as I can into an hour. Um, there's, there's, there is a lot to pack in, and I will, uh, I will try to keep it at an overview level. Um, uh, so our goals for today, as, as Kim had laid them out to me, were to um, summarize some of the challenges in the medical research and development system for folks who, whose day job is not to pay attention uh, to this all the time, um, and to outline the process for translating promising scientific discoveries into medical solutions that are accessible to patients. Um, and so I thought I ought to start by explaining a little more what Faster Cures does. Um, we were uh, founded in 2003. Uh, so a decade old now, um, and uh, our mission, briefly put, is to save lives by saving time. We are a, a nonprofit organization, uh, a think tank, although we like to also call ourselves an action tank because we hope we're not just sitting around thinking all day, but actually helping uh, take action to solve some of the problems we've identified. Um, and uh, we look across the entire medical research system, uh, irrespective of disease, uh, area. We are not disease specific. We are not sector specific. We are not um, profession specific. We are interested in understanding where the bottlenecks are in the medical research system, that slow progress, and trying to um, address some of those and to highlight places where uh, positive progress is being made, which is more often the case. There are many uh, places where progress is being made, but they aren't well known. They aren't replicated. They aren't scaled. And um, the players don't come together to work to work uh, in collaboration on them. So we, uh, one way we work is to try to create opportunities and provide a platform for non-traditional allies to come together to share ideas and find partners. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we work across diseases, sectors, and disciplines. And uh, as Kim mentioned, we are a center of the Milken Institute organizationally. Um, the Milken Institute is an economic think tank um, that's based in California. We are um, based in Washington, D.C., and we're born out of Mike Milken's interest in disease research and disease research philanthropy. Uh, as some of you may know, he uh, founded the Prostate Cancer Foundation when he himself was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and um, uh, but was, you know, as a business person, very frustrated by what he quickly perceived were the dysfunctions in the medical research system, regardless of the disease area. So not, you know, uh, particular to prostate cancer, but, but but shared in every disease area. And so he created Faster Cures as a place to try to uh, analyze and address those um, challenges across disease areas. Um, I wanted to take just a moment to tip my hat to the, the CFS community and the CFIS Association for undertaking this 
this effort, um, the webinar series and the larger uh, effort uh, to interact with the FDA around the patient-centered drug development initiative, um, and, and even broader than that, um, the CFIS Association's efforts in, uh, with its research agenda. Um, and I want to do that by highlighting a piece of work we did um, in 2011. It was a report we did called Back to Basics, and it looked at the HIV um, AIDS advocacy movement as a model for catalyzing change. Um, uh, we had certainly heard, and many of you may have heard as well, folks saying, um, you know, if, if only we could do what the HIV AIDS community did to really uh, shake up the system, to get people's attention, to um, uh, you know, get uh, resource, resources allocated, research dollars ad, uh, allocated. Um, the FDA focused on approving new treatments, getting them to patients faster, and they have really been able to transform what was a death sentence into a chronic disease in many cases, certainly not in all cases and in all places, but, uh, but I don't think that's, that's an enormous overstatement. Um, so we, we, we took a, a deeper dive into the HIV advocacy story and interviewed a lot of the participants and tried to identify the elements of their success. And uh, attention, getting people's attention was certainly one of them. And I think uh, I certainly remember, and many of you who were around then certainly remember um, probably the, the photographs, the, the videos of people chaining themselves to the you know, fence at the NIH and storming the NIH director's office and leafleting the campus and, and doing the same with the FDA. Um, and that certainly was an important element of their success, but it wasn't, it wasn't sufficient. It wasn't the only uh, thing that allowed them to be successful. And there's a quote here from Margaret Hamburg, who at that time was a, a public health official in New York, so she uh, had a role at that time in that, um, in that whole uh, drama. And uh, now she is, of course, the FDA commissioner. And she said when we interviewed her, it wasn't that they were simply advocates. It was that they really were contributors and that they really brought a very sophisticated understanding. Um, and, and that's the knowledge and solutions uh, part of the model that we spent a lot of time focusing on. Um, because the HIV AIDS advocates, um, in many cases, really educated themselves at a very deep level about how the process works, how the drug development process works, how the FDA approval process works. Um, and they were not just chained to the gates of these institutions. They were actually inside these institutions at the tables uh, when decisions were made about where resources were allocated, how clinical trials were designed, what the priorities were. They actually were engaged in developing some new models for regulatory uh, review and approval, like the treatment IND, which I'll mention again later, um, that allowed new treatments to get to pac into patients' hands faster, accelerated approval. These are things that are still uh, available and helping patients today, and they really came out of this movement. Um, and uh, again, those things probably wouldn't have happened if all the advocates had been on the outside <laughs> looking in. They were, they were real participants. Um, so again, that's my way of saying that this is uh, really a terrific effort that um, this community is engaged in. Um, so Kristen, uh, can, I, yeah. can I stop? Can you slow down just a tad? Um, sure. Some of our listeners, like me, are in the south, and we're used to a little bit slower. You're in the north, and she's up in Connecticut. I and apologize. <laughs> so. I am a northerner. <laughs> Great. And I Thanks. live an hour from New York City, so I am You've got to get it in now. fast. And it's in my, it's faster cures. We're all about faster right. everything. So well, I we all have a sense of urgency, but I want everybody <laughs> to hear um, every word you're saying because it's so important. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for interrupting me. Um, so my, my first task is to talk a little bit about the challenges in the medical research system. And again, there are many, and we could spend a very long time talking about them all. Um, but I'm going to try to summarize them in a useful way. Um, and we at Faster Cures tried to do that um, last year uh, by developing this infographic. Um, and we use it in a uh, social media campaign that we call Time Equals Lives, which is available uh, online at timeequalslives.org. Um, and uh, um, it's, I, I will kind of dive into the four different qu quadrants of this infographic in more detail in, in, in just a moment. But, uh, you know, we were trying to summarize uh, uh, what, the, what the, this is our problem statement, our statement of the problem. And um, I'm going to dive into each of these quadrants individually. But before I do that, I wanted to show these two images, magazine covers. Um, because they exemplify an experience that I frequently have, and I imagine uh, many of you on the phone have or on the line have as well, which is uh, that you pick up a newspaper or a magazine and you see on the cover on the front page a big story about some amazing new scientific breakthrough that holds the promise to um, uh, cure a disease or 
provide a, a significantly better treatment for a disease. You know, the cure for cancer is right around the corner, and um, and then nothing happens. What you know, where you, ne you never see the follow-up story. You feel, uh, and th this is a kind of a good example of that. I'm sure many of you remember in 2000 the uh, Human Genome Project, uh, the success of the Human Genome Project, and there were many stories like this in Time, cracking the code, the day for the ages, personalized medicine is upon us, and then. Just a few years ago, when a decade had passed, there were plenty of stories like this one on the cover of Nature, the human genome at 10, growing pains of the genomics age, the best is yet to come, where are the cures, what's come of all this, this uh, investment and effort that we've made, and you know, we certainly uh, know that there, uh, much has come of this particular effort. And another thing we know at Faster Cures is that science is hard and it's unpredictable. So that's, there, there are many good reasons why progress is slow. But um, to me, this was kind of a, a good illustration of this, um, I think, frustration that a lot of people feel with not understanding the process, uh, you know, what happens after we, we achieve that great scientific breakthrough. That's not the end of the story. It's really just the beginning. Um, so the first uh, quadrant of that infographic is about how it takes too long. Uh, an average of 15 years to turn a scientific discovery into a new medical solution that can improve and save lives. Um, that number is different in different fields in central nervous system diseases, for example. It can be up to a third longer than in other disease areas, but on average it's about 15 years from a, from a basic fundamental science, scientific discovery to a new product that actually makes it into the hands of patients. Um, uh, about one in every 10,000 scientific scientific discoveries or, or compounds that could become a potential uh, therapeutic actually make it to market. So there's an enormous amount of attrition along the way. Um, 80 to 90 percent of drug development projects fail before they even get tested in humans. So even the, the clinical trial process, which you know, we, we feel that we know something about, uh, even before we get to that stage, 80 to 90 percent of these projects uh, have have failed and have gone by the wayside. And that's not these are not necessarily bad things. The one in 10,000, 80 to 90 percent, this is just, uh, it's, it's an iterative process. There's a process of attrition that goes on. And um, that's just, you know, the part of the time lag or the reason that it takes so long. Although we do feel that that, that, that uh, iteration and that failure could actually take place more quickly. Um, it costs too much. This is the second quadrant of that infographic. Um, more than a billion dollars to bring one new therapy from lab to market. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is data from the Tufts Center for Drug Development um, that shows that it's actually significantly higher than uh, one billion dollars. There are even people who figure it at more than four billion dollars, but I'm not sure we subscribe to that, uh, to that number. But uh, certainly more than a billion dollars to get a new treatment from a lab to a patient. That has to encompass um, all of the failures along the way. Um, so uh, all that work that has to happen to get to that, that one compound that actually has a positive impact on a patient uh, has to get uh, caught up in the, um, you know, in the cost of the successful therapy once it gets into the marketplace. Um, more than $100 billion is spent every year on R&D by all the sectors involved in medical research. That's the government, industry, philanthropy, all the sectors together spend more than $100 billion. That last figure I saw actually was $136 billion. Uh, in uh, 2011 on R&D, and yet only 35 new drugs were approved by the FDA in 2011, um, which doesn't feel like a very good uh, return on investment rate <laughs> if we're spending $100 billion every year and getting about 30 new medicines on the market. Um, now, 35 was a big improvement over the previous year when only 21 new drugs were approved. Uh, in 2012, it was actually 39, so we have a little bit of a positive trend going. Um, and in, uh, in some measure, it's, it's uh, about the quality or the number of applications that the FDA is getting and, and not just about what they're approving versus not approving. Um, only five cents of every U.S. health dollar goes to medical research. So we spend an awful lot of money treating disease. We don't spend very much of it on trying to uh, discover better treatments and cures for disease. Um, I wasn't going to spend uh, uh, very much time on the last two quadrants because I don't think I need to with this audience for sure. Uh, one in three Americans lives with a deadly or debilitating disease for which there are no cures and few meaningful treatment options. Uh, every 68 seconds someone develops Alzheimer's, 24 seconds cancer, 18 seconds diabetes, and the list goes on. Uh, and you know, the bottom line here for this entire enterprise is about saving lives. 
and um, if we are not currently ourselves patients, uh, we will be at some point. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so from the from the appealing graphics, I'm now going to descend into the into the uh, the, the less the less appealing bulleted <laughs> uh, laundry list. But um, I wanted to kind of delve into a little bit into uh, so what's the problem here? Why are we in this pickle? Uh, why are we in this situation? Um, there are lots of reasons, obviously. Um, one is that the academic medical research establishment, uh, which, and I kind of wanted to start here because this is where most of the, uh, you know, fundamental scientific discoveries are, are coming from, uh, which is fueled largely by funding from the National Institutes of Health by taxpayer dollars, uh, not entirely, but largely, uh, is not really oriented around curing diseases. It's oriented around studying human biology. Um, and while insights into human biology are obviously the foundation of any progress against disease, so this is absolutely necessary, they are not sufficient to actually produce a product. And that's, we're going to talk about that more in the course of this webinar. Uh, and to a significant degree, the incentives in this system and the culture of this system are not really aligned with moving promising ideas forward into development. Um, and here are some of the reasons for that. Um, the, there is an infrastructure and a reward system in academia. Uh, academic uh, scientists, while they um, almost undoubtedly got into this line of work because they wanted to help people and, and produce uh, progress for people, um, you know, are operating in a system where their professional security depends on getting tenure for the most part. And getting tenure depends on things like publishing articles in peer-reviewed journals, having those articles cited. Um, it's called your impact factor. Uh, the number of times that your research, your article, is cited by other people in their work, uh, the number of grants that they are awarded, the size of the grants that they're awarded, um, IP protection, intellectual property prote protection, um, lab space that they've acquired uh, or that has been built, licensing revenue that the institutions, uh, the academic institutions get from licensing those discoveries out to industry. These are the kinds of metrics for success that are used in uh, academic medical research um, which are not necessarily oriented around um, developing a new therapy, um, moving it forward into the development pipeline, uh, contributing to a product that actually makes it to a patient, uh, let alone you know, produces uh, tangible outcomes for that patient. Uh, and there are, good, there are some good reasons for that, but it's not really an incentive system that, that works ultimately for patients. There's little emphasis on specific goals or milestones in most of the grants that academic researchers work with. They're uh, required to uh, perform the work that they said they would perform in the grant to produce a report uh, to let uh, the funder know if any publications came of it. Um, but there are not really specific goals or milestones that are about uh, moving the work forward into the development pipeline. Um, competition for grants and for publication discourages communication and data sharing among researchers. Um, uh, particularly in biology can be a fairly solitary lot. Not really true in some other scientific fields like physics where you have to work on a large team. You just can't do it by yourself. You need big machines and people have to share resources and share information. But, uh, uh, so that's certainly not uh, a positive incentive. Um, grant review and funding are highly conservative. Um, that has typically been true. It's certainly even more true in an era of declining budgets. Uh, given the current budget situation in Washington, um, uh, you know, budgets are not going up as they did in the late 90s, early 2000s when the NIH budget doubled. Uh, funding success rates are going down. Um, reviewers tend to favor more experienced researchers who have data that points to positive, uh, potentially positive results. Uh, they don't tend to favor younger investigators who might have a more path-breaking idea but don't really have a track record or uh, data to, to point to a positive result. Um, the average age for uh, an NIH R01 grant, which is the um, uh, sort of uh, typical investigator uh, initiated grant, is the average age is 42 now. And I think um, most of us, or some of us may know the uh, data point that uh, most Nobelists perform their uh, prize winning work in their 20s and 30s. Um, so, uh, and NIH is now funding more scientists over the age of 70 than under the age of 30. Um, the, there's also, uh, it's also a very investigator-initiated culture, so proposals tend to be, uh, you know, things that an investigator is interested in working on. Proposals are evaluated on the merits of that individual idea uh, rather than 
uh, having any prioritizing or agenda setting for a disease area as a whole. Um, and that's also been true of foundation funding in the past. It's uh, starting to change. Many of these things are starting to change, but there's, it's slow, particularly in these larger institutions. Um, and we, we certainly see the uh, grant making changing in the foundation world, and that's uh, the train network that Kim uh, mentioned, which I'll talk about again as well. Um, academic medical research is certainly not the only um, uh, sector that has its challenges. Industry has significant challenges as well. They obviously uh, have stakeholders and investors that they have to answer to in addition to wanting to get products on the market that will help patients. Uh, Kristen? On blockbuster medicines or expiring. Yeah. Kristen, can you, can you just define industry yes. for folks who may not be familiar with that term? Oh, Thank sure. You. Uh, so this, is the, this would be pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, um, you know, big pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer or Merck. Um, uh, there are also smaller pharmaceutical companies, uh, biotechnology companies are more uh, recent additions to the field in the last couple of decades, like um, some of the bigger ones are Genentech or Genzyme, you may have heard of. Uh, some of those uh, address diseases, rare diseases, but many of them are also engaged with more common disease areas. And in some sense, the pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies are, are joining, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies are acquiring biotechnology companies. They're, they're kind of becoming one big, uh, we used to refer to them as kind of two different uh, two different types of companies, but they're sort of becoming one big, uh, one big industry, uh, biopharmaceutical industry, I should say. Um, so, uh, so, you know, patents on, on very large lucrative medicines like Liptor are expiring. There's a whole wave of them that's kind of gone through uh, patent expiration, which means that generics can come on the market, and so uh, not as much um, revenue is coming into the companies. Research and development costs are double what they were a decade ago. Costs are going through the roof uh, for conducting the research and development of these products. Uh, companies are increasingly becoming risk averse. They are interested in investing later along the research pathway, which I'll show you in a minute. They're becoming more conservative in their decisions about what to fund, so they may prefer to fund um, a, uh, a product that's piggybacking on somebody else's successful product instead of funding a, a very novel uh, type of product um, because there's less risk in it. Um, venture capital, um, so uh, sort of the, the, the funders of the more um, high-risk innovative companies in the past has, is becoming increasingly scarce for early-stage companies, for very young companies doing uh, early-stage research. Um, there's less funding available. It tends to also uh, be looking for more secure investments and not risky investments. Uh, investors in general want returns on their investment in time frames that are just not suited to life sciences. So if you have a 15-year window between when a discovery is made and a product gets out the pipeline, um, you know, most investors want to see a return on their money in five to seven years. So they will take it elsewhere, maybe to internet companies or some other uh, clean tech companies uh, where the time frames are not nearly as long and they might actually see a return in, in more finite time. Uh, so lots and lots of challenges on the industry front as well. Um, so this all sounds like kind of a big mess, uh, and whose job is it to fix it? Um, I put this photo up here of silos just to leave with you the impression, which is, in fact, real that these different sectors, industry, academia, uh, in government, all tend to operate in these, in these silos, and there are even silos within silos of, you know, uh, or sectors not communicating with one another, not collaborating, not working together. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, this is a difficult problem to tackle. Um, so just for, to, you know, for a little levity, we've inc I've included a few cartoons here. Um, is it the NIH's job to fix this? And the um, grant reviewer says, you are completely free to carry out whatever research you want so long as you come to these conclusions. <laughs> Which sort of refers to my earlier point about, you know, they, they're looking for uh, things uh, that have a very high likelihood of success because that looks better. Um, is it academia's job to fix this? As the sign on the wall says, thank you for not doing research that has already been done. Uh, again, a reference to the fact that there's often not a lot of communication in academia, uh, learning from others' mistakes. Uh, there's not a lot of incentive for people to publish their uh, experiments that were not successful, even though lots of folks might be able to learn from those. Um, is it industry's job to fix this? Here's our, our smart R&D guy who has just invented the wheel, and the finance guys say, I can't see it catching on, and the marketing guys want to know if it comes in different colors. So 
just because you've got uh, some really promising research in your, in your company R&D uh, quarters doesn't mean it's going to see the light of day either. And then finally, is it the patient's job to fix this? And my personal favorite, Calvin, says, brother, you doubting Thomas is getting in the way of more scientific advances with your stupid ethical questions. This is a brilliant idea. Hit the button, will ya? And while I don't endorse Calvin's comment about stupid ethical questions, uh, this does give a sense of the, the passion and the urgency that patient uh, groups and individual patients bring into the, into the discussion. And not surprisingly, probably Faster Cures believes it has to be all of them working together, that no one can do it alone. This, this whole enterprise has just become so complex. Um, and there are so many players, and we really feel the patient groups have a very key role in helping to put this puzzle together and, and helping be the glue that keeps the, the pieces of the puzzle together and, and uh, uh, you know, because of that drive to get um, things done for the patients. Um, so now I'm going to uh, dive into the pipeline. Um, the uh, continuum of research and development of products. And uh, if you've spent any time looking at this, uh, you know, drug development uh, set of issues, you've probably seen many different versions of this pipeline graphic. Um, I will show you several different versions of this pipeline graphic because for some reason there doesn't seem to be one that has all of the information on it that I, I would like to convey. Um, so please bear with me as I, I cycle through a couple of these. But basically, um, the development of a new therapy uh, moves from left to right here um, in very general terms. Um, it doesn't really look this nice and neat and linear. There are lots of loops in the process and dead ends and go, no go decisions, but this is the general overview. On the very far left, we have uh, basic research, basic discovery, discovery research. People call it different things. Uh, it's the earliest stage carried out with for the advancement of knowledge without necessarily any regard to its application to practical problems. Um, this is really everything I say in this webinar really is a, a generalization. Uh, there are certainly researchers who are interested in uh, solving practical problems and are capable of moving their ideas forward to try to do that, but um, this is just, a, a, you know, that is not generally the, the, uh, um, the, the, the kind of uh, point from which a lot of basic research springs. It tends to be funded, is largely funded by public sources, and that is largely the NIH. Uh, I apologize, this data is a little bit out of date, um, but 29, uh, sorry, $30 billion uh, from the NIH. There's another $10 billion from other federal agencies like the Defense Department and uh, uh, National Science Foundation, places like that. Um, and it has uh, generally you know, not reached very far beyond this basic research stage. Um, again, a generalization, but has not reached very far, the funding has not reached very far beyond that stage. Then we have this uh, middle stage. Uh, the first four arrows are what's called translational research. Uh, this is the process of applying these uh, promising ideas and insights generated through basic research to the treatment and prevention of disease. There, it, this is the critical bridge between basic research and clinical research. It's a very um, you know, underappreciated, not well understood, uh, and definitely under-resourced part of the research process, uh, which is why it's uh, some people call it the valley of death, um, and I will talk a little bit more about it. Um, but then starting with that blue arrow, arrow that says phase one, clinical trial, uh, uh, we move into clinical research. And this is research in human subjects that aims towards approved treatments for patients. Um, and that's th these are the clinical trials that we tend to hear about that I think most of us are a little bit familiar with. Uh, and it, it, there are three phases of those clinical trials uh, in human subjects. Uh, phase one clinical trials look at the safety of the product, usually in a very small group of healthy volunteers. Uh, phase two clinical trials look at the efficacy and the correct dosing in a larger group of patients, so how well it, how well it appears to work. And then phase three is really the larger scale test of the product in a, a more diverse population uh, to get a better sense of the eff efficacy to develop guidelines for how it should be used to compare it to existing products for the same indication. So that's the, that's the largest, uh, most expensive stage of the research process. Um, now, many companies and investors are no longer primarily, or are, are, or are primarily in, interested in investing in compounds that have established proof of concept, um, which is early confirmation that your hypothesis is valid about the disease and the treatment. And without a proof of concept, drug development can't move forward. Proof of concept tends to happen in late phase one 
or even early phase two clinical trials. So that's why our, we've drawn our valley of death here to move into that, even into that clinical research stage. Companies and investors are, because they're becoming more conservative and costs are so high, are really reluctant to invest before they see that proof of concept. So we've got a big problem here where there's no, uh, there's a lot of work to be done and not very much money. Um, I'm, this is another version of the pipeline. I'm just quickly going to mention uh, that, uh, you know, again, it's, it's not really a linear process. It really is a more of a cycle, and it needs to be even more of a cycle where we are learning constantly, even once products are on the market uh, and are in patients. We need to be learning more about how they work. We need to be making more observations in patients and feeding them back into the research pipeline. So just to give you a sense that uh, this is really not a linear process, and, and we show our patients in the middle of it always. Um, this is another view of the pipeline. Um, that show, has a little more information on it that wasn't kind of captured in that previous version. Again, we have basic research way out there on the left. This is from the pharmaceutical industry, and they call it pre-discovery because they think they discover things. Um, so, so to them, basic research is pre-discovery. But it really shows you how we, we, we're going from potentially as many as 10,000 compounds that could be a drug, and we're winnowing it, we're winnowing it down. Once we go through these translational step, steps, we're down to about 250. Then once you get into the phase of the clinical research and people, you really winnowed it way down to about five potential new drugs. Uh, and you'll see right there uh, in the white line that at this point you're submitting an investigational new drug application to the FDA to say, hey, uh, we're interested in potentially uh, having this approved by you for use in patients and we're going to start doing clinical research. Uh, that's, where the, that's what the IND tells the FDA. We get into clinical research, we've got in phase one about 20 to 100 patients, in phase two 100 to 500 patients, in phase three 1,000 to 5,000 patients. Now these are, uh, again, generalizations. If it's a rare disease, there are far, far fewer people in a, in a trial, but, uh, and, and there could be, uh, the FDA could require you to have many more in your phase three trial. Um, at, at the point that the clinical research is, conduct, is finished, a new drug application is submitted to the FDA, and then we're down to one FDA-approved product. So I just like this graphic because it kind of shows you that uh, winnowing process that happens as you go along the way. Um, the last pipeline graphic I'm going to show you is uh, one that we got from the NIH, and it's a terrible graphic, and I apologize to everyone, and especially to Kim for even using it. But again, it shows something that the others don't really show very well. Um, and again, you'll see on the bottom here this left to right um, process from basic research they're calling it here uh, target identification because you're identifying the basic discovery is identifying something that if you can impact it or change it might change the course of a disease. And it's moving through all the stages out there to the regulatory review by FDA and even beyond. Um, then they overlay on it the costs of the process. And you can see that in the early stages, costs are relatively low. And they stay relatively low through the translational steps until you get to clinical trials, to clinical research in humans where the costs really start to rise um, exponentially, really. Um, and when you get to phase three, they're really very high. Um, then in this slide, they've overlaid the probability of success. And the reason I like this slide is because it makes such a nice funnel. It's really a, a good visual to, to help sort of grasp how this pipeline works. Um, the probability uh, is a little hard to grasp. But basically, as the line is going down, your, your odds of success are actually going up or improving. So what, I should actually label it, the risk is going down. So on the, in the basic discovery stage on the far left, the risks of failure are really high. But as you continue to do this work and go through the research process, the risks are, are declining. And um, you know, by the time you get to clinical trials, it's really quite low. Um, and that's uh, what industry likes. If they're going to have to bear the high cost of clinical research, they want the risk to be really low. Um, and I use this slide a lot when I talk to nonprofit foundations about their funding strategies because um, this is a space, this early stage where the costs are low but the um, risks are high is a place that foundations are increasingly uh, finding it useful to put their money because there are not other funders, the fun other funders can't tolerate the risk. And uh, if foundations have the appetite for it, they can really play in the space because they don't need a lot of dollars, which as we know, all know foundations don't really have. Um, so I'm going to talk a little Kristen? bit about... 
Yes. I just wanted to um, draw the analogy that I read, and you'll know which publication Faster Cures included it in, that the that that slide that you were just on um, is very similar to the movie industry and the the big studios trying to find the next summer blockbuster movie um, is a better parallel for drug discovery than some of the other models that that often get used um, that you've got all these screenplays coming in and you have to figure out which one is going to hit right in order right. to make the big uh, box office hit so I, I thought right. maybe our audience might appreciate that um, comparison as well. That's right. I think we'd all like to think there's a little more science behind this process, but sometimes I wonder <laughs> uh, picking the next uh, picking the next big hit in Hollywood. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to describe some of these uh, things that happen in the translational research stage in that middle valley of death, because um, as I said, they're very uh, they're less understood and uh, definitely under resourced. Um, but critical, and they're very unsexy, and I think that's part of the problem, is that uh, academic uh, researchers certainly don't have uh, much incentive to uh, conduct them, and industry is kind of shying away from it. But, um, so, you know, this is ve they're very complex and iterative processes uh, that can really be a bottleneck. And um, so I'm just going to describe them to give you a sense of the complexity of what, what has to be done to turn a basic discovery into a drug uh, that can be given to a patient. Uh, the first is tar called target validation. So when you've um, come up with this target this, you know, that you think uh, has a key role to play in the disease, you have to demonstrate that this target is involved in the disease process, in fact, and that impacting the target is likely to have a positive therapeutic effect. So that's no mean feat, validating that target that, and that you can, if you impact it, you can change the course of the disease is a significant step that has to be taken. Then you have to develop an assay or a test to measure the activity of a compound on that target. Um, that is also not uh, a, always not a very easy task to develop an appropriate test to show that you've actually had an impact. Um, then there's what's called screening and hits to leads, uh, where you screen a bunch of compounds, either existing or new, that you've designed for activity against this target. And those are called hits. And then you further winnow the field of hits to higher quality leads. Then you have to go through what's called lead optimization, which is when you refine that lead compound to improve its drug characteristics, so how it gets you know, taken in by the body and, and, uh, and all that, and ultimately produce a drug candidate that's ready for testing in humans. And as you can imagine, when, you, know, you don't always succeed the first time you try. So this is an iteration. You have to keep going through this cycle of validation assay development, screening, you know, et cetera. And then you have to go through a series of uh, preclinical development steps to gather your uh, any existing data or doing new studies through animal testing often that shows that the compound is safe and at least somewhat effective in humans. There has to be some baseline level of safety and efficacy data to even get to, um, the, to clinical research. Um, so a lot of challenges with this. As I've said already, lack of funding. Funding can be hard to come by from the NIH for sure, even though they are trying to reach more into this space. And companies are becoming more risk averse and shying away from this space. Technical expertise is lacking. Most basic researchers simply don't have the skills or knowledge to move their discoveries through the pipeline. If they are even interested in doing this, they need information and help to carry it forward. Um, lack of incentives, as, I, as I've said, for this doesn't count for tenure in most places. Uh, if a scientist does have an interest in carrying it forward, they will usually want to collaborate with companies, and that often opens them up to accusations of conflict of interest, which you know, certainly exists in some cases, but in many cases is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, but it, is, it can be a disincentive for scientists to want to even move into this more, uh, more commercial space. And I've mentioned the high risk of failure, so lots of challenges in this space. Um, I'm only going to briefly touch on the role that we think philanthropy has to play here because it's a, 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 my passion and it's, it's a very significant interest for faster cures. But we recognize philanthropy as a very small uh, sector in terms of funding medical research. This chart shows it's about 2%. These numbers are from 2010, but the, it, the percentage almost never changes. It's always about 2%. So I think some people wonder why we spend so much time thinking about philanthropy. But we just find that it can, if motivated appropriately, play a really key role because it's more flexible and entrepreneurial potentially. And Kim mentioned this train network that we have of uh, 55 
foundations that are interested in being more strategic with their research, playing a role in, for instance, these translational research stages where there's a big gap and a big need in order to move ideas forward. Um, we have a, a website and uh, lots of events and activities to allow these groups to interact with each other, to learn from one another. We want to amplify their messages to the other players, to the academ academic community, to the government, to industry, and help them connect up with those players so that uh, they can have a bigger impact. Um, and as Kim mentioned, we've, we've produced a number of publications. These are our uh, two most recent about what we many people call venture philanthropy, this more strategic entrepreneurial philanthropy uh, to help highlight it and help more people do it. Um, and I just wanted to mention one success story, um, hopefully to, to add a little inspiration here. Um, and that is the approval at the beginning of 2012 um, of a drug called Kaleidico, uh, which was made by a company called Vertex Pharmaceuticals, but with very, a lot of support from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, CFF, if, for those of you who know about it, uh, or for those who don't know about it, is a, a, you know, large established foundation, has been around a long time, has raised a lot of money, um, and so I, sometimes it can be a hard example to relate to, but, um, you know, they decided about 10 years ago that they needed to be, they couldn't just keep funding research the way they always had, and they, and they had to be more engaged, particularly with industry, if what they really cared about was getting a treatment to a patient, ultimately. Um, that it wasn't just going to happen on its own. And so they've been uh, engaged in funding companies, which is something not a lot of foundations do yet. Um, but, uh, and, they, and they did fund Vertex to the tune of $75 million over many years uh, to help uh, develop not only this product, but uh, some others that are in the pipeline. Um, but they also provided um, patient resources, uh, patients in their clinical trials, a patient registry. And I think as important as anything, they provided momentum and drive to continue this research even when the company was acquired twice, they really you know, hung in there and, and when the new acquiring company might have just dropped it because it was a rare disease, um, you know, the CF Foundation really, uh, really hung in there and, and kept the focus on this and the momentum. And um, the reason Kaladico to me is such a big deal is that it is potentially a cure for a subset of patients who have cystic fibrosis. Um, you know, we don't use the word cure lightly even though it's in our name. We know it's a big deal. Uh, and that new, new treatment, new and better treatments is, uh, is you know, maybe the nearer term goal. Um, but, uh, you know, for patients who have this, there's only about 1,200 of them. But if they take this drug, it could actually cure their disease. Um, and so, to me, this is a great example of how a foundation can create the momentum that propels research down the pipeline and out the other end. Um, and this, to me, is a favorite innovation quote from Steve Jobs, that innovation has nothing to do with how many R&D dollars you have. When Apple came up with the Mac, IBM was spending at least 100 times more on R&D. Uh, it's not about the money. It's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get it. Um, so a little bit of a simplistic view of the world, but I think, uh, I think a, a, a good one nonetheless. Um, so the last thing I'm going to talk about, and this is just a little bit, is the FDA and the review and approval process. I know that uh, subsequent webinars will um, uh, dive into this a little more deeply in this series, um, but I uh, did want to introduce it a little bit. Um, and I'm going to start by providing a little background on the FDA. Um, some of you may, may know some of this data, but um, I'll bet a lot of folks don't. Um, the FDA uh, has about 12,000 employees and more than 200 offices and 13 labs in 50 states, so they are, um, they are spread uh, widely. Um, they regulate more than a trillion dollars of consumer goods. That's a quarter of all consumer spending. So a quarter of every dollar that you spend every day on products uh, is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And that's not just drugs, vaccines, biological products, and medical devices, which you might expect, but it's also food, which is obviously in their name, cosmetics, pet food, your cell phones, um, the radiation uh, that's emitted from cell phones. Um, so they have an absolutely enormous portfolio. Uh, they are responsible for monitoring a third of all imports to this country, um, and they do not have a very big budget to do it with. Um, 25 years ago, the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control were the same size. Uh, today, the CDC budget is nearly three times as large. We always like to use the data point that um, uh, the FDA's budget is about the same size as the Montgomery County, Maryland public schools budget. 
So to do all this work and stay on top of all of these potential problems and, and support innovation in the drug and device industry to actually get these products out, um, to patients, they they are doing that with as much money as a county in a small state spends on its public public schools. Kristen, um, I, I remember Mr. Milken saying at uh, one of the sessions at the Milken Global last year that FDA FDA's budget is roughly the same as what Americans spend on potato chips every year, exactly. and that was that was stunning to me. Yep. <laughs> so right, and 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 now we want them to to. Uh, uh, get uh, approve the new drugs to deal with the consequences of all the potato chips we right. use. Right. <laughs> so, uh, me included. Um, so the uh, their appropriation, as I know here, is almost entirely staff costs. It's all about the people and the manpower to do all this work. Um, it, they need nearly a 6% increase every year just to sustain their existing programs. And as I think I mentioned before, they keep getting new uh, mandates from the Congress added all the time. I suspect the, uh, the, the latest one will be to regulate all of these um, uh, uh, compounding pharmacies that we've been hearing about in the news where people were uh, actually died from uh, using uh, of meningitis from using something that was produced by these compounding pharmacies, which are not regulated by the FDA. So. Uh, I suspect they will now be asked to do that and probably not be given many, if any, additional resources to do it. Um, and again, we're in a declining budget environment, so uh, resources are not likely to go up significantly. Um, as I note at the bottom, you know, we as Americans essentially invest two cents every day um, in the Food and Drug Administration to, to keep, keep uh, that 25% of our, our spending safe um, and, and effective. Um, I think I'm not going to talk too much about the FDA drug approval process because, as I, uh, first of all, I, I've touched on many of these aspects already, um, and also I know you'll be talking about them in future webinars, but uh, Kim had prescribed this nice FDA infographic as a background reading for the webinar if folks were interested, so I thought I would I put it up, and I was also quite impressed by this nice infographic they had put together. Um, so it, again, it, it shows many of the steps that I've uh, talked about. Um, you know, drugs are developed by, um, you know, a company or a, an academic institution or academic a researcher. Uh, they need to test them for um, uh, safety in, uh, largely in animals um, and develop some data around them before they uh, file an in investigational new drug application uh, stating their intention to um, or their desire to, uh, you know, move it into clinical testing in humans. Um, uh, one important point I did want to make, uh, actually, is that FDA itself does not test drugs, and I think that's uh, something that maybe not everybody appreciates. I don't know that I appreciated it. Um, they have to rely on the data submitted by sponsors, um, and they, I will say, have significant data challenges. Um, data is not submitted in standardized forms uh, or formats. It's not collected in standardized formats always. Um, it's, uh, even getting it electronically is an enormous challenge for them. Um, you know, they, they get binders and binders, shipping containers full of binders of data um, about some drug applications. So uh, this uh, data is a significant challenge for them and, and having to rely on that data. Um, uh, they will hold meetings with sponsors before uh, filing INDs to discuss their plans and to make sure they're uh, developing the type of data that, that, that will be needed to uh, file that application. Um, and uh, I think I noted at the beginning that there is uh, now a treatment IMD, a treatment investigation with new drug application, which came from the HIV AIDS advocacy movement that allows the use of experimental therapies for patients with serious or life-threatening illness who are not in the clinical trials uh, for, this, for the therapy. Um, so they can actually, patients can actually use it while the trials are ongoing. Um, then it moves into the three phases of clinical research, phase one, phase two. At the end of phase two, there's typically a meeting between FDA and the sponsor um, before they move into the large-scale studies in phase three to make sure everybody's in sync about those trials and their design. Um, and then we move into expensive and large phase three trial or trials. Um, and then um, uh, there's a meeting after phase three. Um, a, a new drug application is filed. Um, the application is reviewed. There's a discussion about drug labeling, which sounds like something straightforward, but if any of you has actually ever pulled that piece of paper out of the box or the package and tried to read it, uh, you'll know it's not a straightforward matter. There's a lot uh, encompassed in the drug labeling that's, um, uh, that, that takes up a lot of uh, time and attention at FDA. Um, and uh, there's inspection of the manufacturing facilities, and then the decision is made about whether to uh, approve the drug or not. Um, 
and uh, just for a point of reference, I think last year in 2012, or I'm sorry, in 2011, there were uh, nine uh, applications that were not approved of, uh, out of the 35, that are in addition to the 35. Um, so, you know, not an enormous number that are not approved versus those that are approved. Um, uh, the last thing I want to mention here is just that 2011 was actually a very good year for quality um, at the FDA in terms of the products that were approved. They not only had a nice uptick in the number of approvals, but 12 of them were, were called first in class, uh, which means that they were a novel, uh, a very, you know, a very novel innovative drug that uh, has a novel mechanism of action. Um, there were 11 that were for orphan indications. There were 15 that were reviewed under what's called priority review, which means uh, an, an accelerated six to 10 month process um, because it's for an, a significant unmet medical need. There were 14 that were reviewed under what's called fast track, which is another uh, faster approval that where the FDA gives additional support to the sponsor and meets with them more often. Um, and then three were granted accelerated approval, which means that they can get out into the market to patients even before they've been, uh, that final approval has been given um, uh, using what they call surrogate endpoints, some, so some other markers of success other than the final one. They will allow uh, some products to get out into patients, again, because there's a significant need for them. Um, so they do have these um, mechanisms for speeding up the process, uh, and they are actually adding new ones. Uh, last year they've, uh, they have a new category called breakthrough therapies, which they're still defining, which again should speed the process up even more for really innovative medicines that are badly needed. Um, there are other innovative efforts underway, like the Patient-Centered Drug Development Initiative that, um, that this community is participating in uh, that came about last year uh, through um, legislation. And um, I think that's probably a good place to end. And I just wanted to commend this community for uh, participating in that process with FDA and helping to make it a meaningful one. You really are setting as the first disease area out of 20 that's being uh, looked at by FDA um, in this patient-centered drug development initiative, you're really setting the template in some ways uh, for the other um, you know, disease communities and organizations to come. So um, I applaud you for, for being involved and for taking it very seriously and educating uh, yourselves to have the greatest impact possible. Um, so I think I've gone on far too long. I, I, I am happy to take uh, a few questions, I'm with the caveat that uh, uh, I don't know, uh, I, can't, I can't answer questions about specific products or, um, you know, things of that nature, but if there are a few that I can, that I can field, I'd be happy to try to do that. So one question that came up, Kristen, and thank you for that tremendous um, information-packed overview. That was just terrific. Uh, how does the, the pipeline compare for drugs that have already been approved for one condition and are being tested for another? Um, and, and the reason uh, that question was asked by one of our participants today, but it comes up a lot because uh, if you look at platforms like Patients Like Me or some of the other broad platforms where patients share information about their treatment, um, CFS, ME-CFS patients use an awful lot of medications that are off-label for ME-CFS but may treat individual symptoms. And there's a tremendous, I think, um, opportunity to look at how well some of those therapies work um, in a more systematized fashion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so you're talking more about off-label use than about repurposing. Right. Um, you know, compounds that companies have abandoned for various reasons. Um, so you're talking more about off-label use, is that right? Or, or just if a company has a product and they want to test it in a new population for a new indication, do they start all the way on the left side of that yeah. pipeline and go all the way to the right, or is there a shortcut? Right. No, there, there are definitely shortcuts. Uh, in the in the review and approval process, um, and so there's been a lot of interest, you know, in many areas in uh, what we call repurposed compounds. So things that um, you know may have been developed and then abandoned by companies, as I said, because they uh, didn't seem appropriate for the indication they were pursuing. Um, I, I think the, the difficulty, the, the diff and, and and part of the attraction is that there has already been a lot of this safety and efficacy data generated, particularly safety data. So if you've already demonstrated that the product is safe, 
um, you're, you're, all, you're ahead of the game. You don't have to develop all that data. You can start at the point of efficacy because now you're looking at a different condition. Is it, it, does, does it actually work in this new condition? Um, so, so that has a lot of attraction. I think the difficulty uh, that people find is, is it more in the business model and in the economics than in the approval, review and approval pathway. Um, because uh, in many cases, um, those, in the case of repurposing compounds, those, they're, they're sometimes off patent. Um, and so there's not really a financial incentive for the company to pursue it, to develop it, to actually manufacture it and get it out to patients. There are a lot of people starting to work, um, you know, at, to work at trying to build better business models around repurposed compounds. And actually some uh, patient organizations are, are proving to be very helpful um, in doing that. And obviously in pursuing that research, they have a lot of interest in pursuing that research. Um, and on the on the, the off-label use question, I think that's also an area where patient groups have been very instrumental in, for instance, patients like me showing that, you know, where a company may not have yet have any, any incentive to study the use of a drug in um, a new indication, particularly there may be a lot of patients, for instance, in a patients like me forum who are taking the drug off-label and are sharing data and information in a pretty structured way about their outcomes, if you can show that to the company and say, we really think you should be pursuing this indication uh, because here's what we're seeing, um, that, that could be a, an incentive for them, again, if the economics are right, um, to, to pursue that. So long, long way of saying the, the, the review and approval process is definitely shorter. The economics need to be there, though, and that's often the more challenging part. Absolutely. And uh, it was a bit of a selfish question on my part because um, <laughs> Suzanne Vernon, our scientific director, will be giving a talk on drug repurposing at the uh, April 25th, 26th FDA workshop. And that is mm -hmm. an area that the Stevens Association, with the generosity of its donors, has invested in, um, in our research program. And we think there is just a lot of uh, unmet potential in, in studying some of the drugs that are already approved by FDA and therefore have the safety profile that you mentioned um, for study and um, particularly for subsets of MECFS patients. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I think we've, we've gotten a couple of other questions that actually might be better addressed if we switch the controls back. I had a few sort of concluding yep. slides before we end up. And I'll see if I can just grab them back from you. Yep, you got it. I do. Okay. So um, I'm going to take just a, a minute because I, I had a lot of, uh, or several people wrote in and said, oh my gosh, this is so depressing and awful. It just sounds like, you know, hope is um, so far off if these pipelines are so long and the process is so expensive and uh, risky will never get anybody involved. And I think that um, one of the messages I'd like to leave everyone with today is that really hope is has never been more um, real and it's never been closer. There is so much happening right now at every step along that pipeline that Kristen showed us. And if you look at what the Stevens Association has done, um, over the years, and I've borrowed here from one of the, the slides that um, uh, one of the one of the other representations of the pipeline that that Kristen didn't use earlier um, that came from the Parkinson's Action Network and is in one of their publications. Can you hear? Welcome to Go to Webinar Web Events Made Easy. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I dropped out for a second. I move in my chair. Kristen, can you hear me? Uh, yes, you sound a little tinny, but little I tinny. can hear you. Okay. Um, for some reason, my mic dropped out. Uh, but this is one of the other representations of the pipeline, so think of it again from the left to the right. And what the Secrets Association has done, um, from the point of its inception, we've always funded research. And up until 2011, we were really playing in the space before you got to we were essentially de-risking the basic science for NIH to invest. And a lot of our successes came in funding pilot studies that then went on to successfully get uh, institute, National Institutes of Health awards or money from the Department of Defense. 
Um, in 2011, our board and scientific advisory board met together and we identified the need to get into the space that Kristen was so uh, importantly describing this valley of death and a little bit into the clinical research. And so now our um, whole research uh, mm -hmm. emphasis is directed at this part of the funding uh, stream. And now we're aiming to de-risk therapy development for industry. And that is going to be the topic of our webinar on April 18th, how, does, how the association is fostering the development of safe and effective therapies for NECFS. So we hope to be with us then. And in the meantime, um, we're going to cover a few other topics. Uh, our webinar next week that Lee Reynolds and I will um, lead is focused on finding your strongest voice for public testimony, but we're also going to talk about the um, patient-focused drug development initiative that Kristen mentioned, and that is the, the series of 20 FDA meetings that are each focused on a different disease area, and FDA has selected NECFS to be the first of those 20. And I think a few people might have misunderstood that, that somehow um, we were at the beginning of a clinical trial for 20 different conditions using the same drugs. But this is really an F effort by the FDA to look at how drugs and therapies are affecting patients' lives and what they want most from their therapy. And so this will be the topic of our uh, webinar next week, and we'll also cover um, effective ways for people to engage in these upcoming opportunities and to make their voices heard. And so we hope you'll join us for that um, program that's timed just before the FDA deadline for submitting uh, written testimony or requesting time at the meeting uh, in April. So that's a bit of a commercial. And uh, we'll send a link to the registration for that program as well as the other five programs in our series. And uh, this is just, uh, again, a little bit of information. If you want more information, these are the sites to go to. I think most of the people registered for this webinar are familiar with these sites. But this is our research first site. And we also have a monthly electronic newsletter that's free that pulls together all the um, sort of top highlights across not only research, but policy, media, um, and association-related news. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We will be posting the recording from today's webinar on our YouTube uh, Solve CFS channel. And we hope that uh, we'll share that link once it's available. Um, again, these are just some of the other topics that we'll cover um, in the course of this six uh, weekly webinar programs. And um, just to introduce for those uh, who don't uh, maybe aren't as familiar with our organization, this is actually the first look we're giving to the public of a, a new um, visual identity that we've created, putting the patient at the center, leveraging patient-centered research to cure NUCFS. And I had somebody note the patient-centered um, language in that tagline. And if I could just speak to that for a moment. As Kristen introduced at the very beginning of today's program, the incentives for academics are not patient-centered. And the incentives for industry are not patient-centered. And we see our role in this whole landscape as uh, keeping the patient at the center of the research and making sure that every investment we make is returned to the patient as a return on investment, not just some financial number or number of publications or number of um, citations or profit back to state shareholders. We really want what we do to translate into meaningful progress in every person affected by NCFS's life. And you will be hearing more about this again in the webinar scheduled for April 18th with Suzanne Vernon, our scientific director, and Mark Stone, our director of development. And just a reminder that you, the patient, are at the center of everything we do. And we thank you for your participation today. And um, if you haven't taken our patient-focused uh, survey, you'll get a link to that with uh, the conclusion of today's program. We hope that you take time to join these 761-plus people that have already done that. Uh, 
And just before we sign off, again, I'd like to thank Kristen for the tremendous uh, information provided to us today and for all the work that Faster Cures does and the ways in which the Secrets Association and uh, our staff have benefited from all of the tremendous resources you make available to the community and to all of us as patients uh, across the spectrum. Kristen? Thank you very much, Kim. I appreciate <laughs> okay. it. I was worried I'd lost audio. Um, nope. <laughs> occasion. So with that, we'll close. We're just a little bit over time, and I thank our audience for hanging in there beyond the 2 o'clock hour. I'm always very impressed with um, the executive director of Faster Cures uh, always ends their webinars exactly at the right minute uh, that they said they would. And I appreciate that, and I'm sorry I didn't uh, measure up to that standard today. But I think it was well worth the extra seven minutes. So, thanks all. you get a quick survey when you exit the webinar today. We hope you'll take time to just click seven buttons and let us know how we did. And we look forward to seeing you back at this same back time, same back channel, next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Hope everybody has a good afternoon and uh, uh, this information has uh, given you a perspective you not, might not have uh, had before. So, thanks again, Kristen, and uh, we'll talk to everyone next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great week. You too.